Hoso maoni wirk, wai wainen kitane ni mua e joski pietaya pos nohtaman e yom MITW podcast. A jospis pietaya pos nopi nohtaman e ne hisikimaka e joso matname neho kihi. Welcome to the Nominee Indian Tribal Wisconsin podcast. I am your host, Sheena Wapus. In this episode, I'm again joined by Gaspon Bowles. He is the Public Information Officer for the Incident Command Center for the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin. He's here to give us uh, his weekly update on COVID-19 and the tribe's response. So welcome, Vaughn, again. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. It's always great. <laughs> so for this episode, um, we kind of have a lot of random questions that were submitted to us. So we're going to go over those and they kind of cover a large variety of topics. So um, the first question uh, that I saw was that around the casino and the fact that it is opening, um, slated to open on May 27th. Um, so one question that a community member had was about the curfew in regards to like operating hours with the casino and how is that going to work? So the casino is still working on their plan for how they're going to operate, especially with the curfew still in effect. Um, obviously, they they want to stay in compliance with the local community. Um, so there have been a couple different dis- options discussed. One is allow casino workers exemption. The other is to just um, operate within the hours of the curfew and shut down at 10. They don't have all the details worked out like that. So they're still, uh, it's up in the air and those details will be released as, as soon as we know. So they're working on it um, and they're, they're going to keep everyone's situation um, in consideration because they don't want to get anyone in trouble and they want to help provide for the community. So Okay, um, another question we had was, do we know if there are any long-term effects um, of COVID-19? I'm going to preface this with a sort of and a yes. Um, So sort of, uh, we haven't seen um, a lot of COVID-19. I mean, it hasn't been around for a long time, so it's hard to say whether or not there are long-term effects. we can say yes that they have seen cases where there's scarring of the lung tissue especially in younger people that get it um, in which case this decreases their lung capacity basically for the rest of their life because instead of having the alveoli which are the tiny little sacs uh within the the lungs that exchange oxygen uh with the blood you have scar tissue which which can't do that the oxygen just can't pass through like uh, can with regular lung tissue. And so there are long-term effects um, as far as, as scarring. Um, they're not sure if they're going to be long-term effects dealing with things like the body's immune system and immune response. So um, there, there are some, there might be more, but we just haven't had enough time to look at um, the effects long-term. What relation is the Kawasaki disease to COVID-19 and how dangerous is it? Okay, so um, let's back that up. That's two questions there to start with. Um, and so let's talk about Kawasaki's disease first. There's, there's a lot to it. Um, Kawasaki's disease is an illness um, that causes inflammation of vessels, blood vessels, um, all sizes. Typically, um, uh, it uh, causes symptoms that uh, are seen as things like fever and bloodshot eyes, um, rashes, um, redness, dry and cracked lips, something called a strawberry tongue where your tongue gets little um, spots and as well as sore throat um, and swollen lymph glands in the neck. This usually happens for patients that are between the ages of like two to 15. So it's seen in younger patients. Um, And it's actually, it has two phases. Um, The second phase uh, can be seen with things like joint pain and diarrhea and vomiting and pain in the the stomach or belly region as well. Um, How dangerous is it? That's that's an interesting question. If it's caught and treated early on, it's not that dangerous. It can be treated with um, high doses of uh, immunoglobulin, which is basically plasma packed with a bunch of antibodies. 
um, and aspirin, high doses of it. Um, and that's it. And that's all it takes to really clear things up. Um, if it's not caught, it can cause long-term damage to the heart for children. It's called acquired um, uh, heart disease. Uh, so it can be a problem. Usually it's not because it's caught before it gets to that point. Um, so it's not too too serious of an issue. Um, the strange thing is they do see it in conjunction with COVID-19. Uh, they don't see it commonly. Um, that was that was something a lot of people were concerned with. But to date, we only have about 110 cases worldwide where there's um, both Kawasaki's disease and coronavirus. So it's really uncommon. Um, in addition, it, well, it may it may be slightly more common, but you know we haven't had some countries that have been completely forthcoming with their numbers. China, Russia, North Korea don't like to share their numbers. Um, and apparently I found this out the other night that the dictator of Kyrgyzstan made it illegal to talk about coronavirus. So we're not really sure worldwide how common it is, but it's, it's pretty uncommon. Um, if someone does contract the coronavirus, that's a child, the odds of them getting it are, are pretty slim. Um, Kawasaki's disease on its own, uh, is not that common. Um, and they also don't know what causes it. So the fact that you can see the Kawasaki's with the COVID is strange. They're not really sure why it happens, um, but it doesn't happen frequently, which is part of the reason they don't know a lot about it. It's because it's, it's just pretty uncommon. Okay. Gotcha. Um, so last week uh, on the podcast episode, you mentioned that UV light is shown to kill the virus, right? Correct. Um, so uh, we had the question, um, does heat affect it in any way? So, a lot of the studies uh, trying to replicate real world conditions are hard to do uh, because it's hard to um, it's hard to replicate sunlight and wind and humidity all at the same time um, as well as the the blend of natural lighting you need so they're they've done small scale studies and they're not sure yet how um, heat and humidity are going to affect um, you know, the, the viability of the virus and the spread of the virus. Um, s there's been speculation so far. Uh, I don't want to spread any rumors, so I'm just going to hold off on that. Um, but so I'm just going to say they're not sure yet. They're, they're still <laughs> okay. working on those studies. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, the next question was, how effective are masks, uh, especially cloth, cloth masks that most people are wearing these days? So masks are effective. They're just... They are. They're effective. That's why healthcare workers wear them. And that's really why we should be wearing them. Um, I had a friend who was a virologist last night tell me about a study they were reading. Um, they found that a, approximately 90% of the COVID spread in New York City could have been contained had everyone just been wearing masks properly. Um, wow. They're effective. They're, they're great. Um, they generally keep people from um, spreading uh, the disease outward. Um, not as much as inhaling in, but a lot of outward spread is contained with a mask. Um, but that's if you're only wearing it properly. I see people running around the stores. Well, I don't because I've only gone to the store once in like three months. <laughs> but I've seen people who have masks and they're just covering their mouth. And that's mm -hmm. not really effective. If you're going to wear a mask and, and you want it to be effective, it's got to cover your nose and it's got to cover your mouth. Um, but it also needs to kind of sit tightly against your face. Um, and the mm -hmm. reason for that is so you don't just cough or sneeze or inhale something out from the sides of your mask. Um, that said, some people are making cloth masks at home. Um, you know, the CDC is recommending those people use um, cotton, two, two layers of, 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 of regular cotton. It could be like t-shirt cotton if you like cutting up your clothes. Um, and, you know, uh, those should fit snugly, loop around your ears um, and be washed um kind of in in proportion to how frequently it's used um so yes use masks if you're out and about and you're going to be anywhere near people um please wear a mask if you're going to the store wear a mask if you're going fishing don't worry too much about it unless you have a friend in your boat and you both get masks or you can just sit in the woods by yourself no mask so anytime you're around people if you can wear a mask it's really going to help uh prevent the spread of of the disease. So, um, 
the purpose of the mask is really mainly for you to protect other people from yourself. Correct. 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 Yeah. yeah. And there's there's a um, an infographic the CDC put out that actually shows um, kind of how effective masks are um, when they're one, when they're worn by one person or two people or neither person has them. Um, and we can actually repost that back onto the social media accounts so everyone can get an idea of, of how useful they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I actually saw one um, that equated it to peeing your pants. So <laughs> That's great. So if both people aren't wearing pants and someone pees, the pee is really going to get on the other person. And if you're wearing pants, you're still going to get pee on you, but... <laughs> Not as much. And right. then if the other person is wearing pants and or if you're both wearing pants and they pee, <laughs> you're not going to get much just keep it to yourself. on you. Yep. Yep. <laughs> I think that was a good analogy. That's really fun. Yeah, that's accurate. <laughs> that's really funny, actually. <laughs> okay. Um, the next question was, is there going to be a second stimulus check? So the second stimulus check... Um, is a good question. It's uh, associated with something called the HEROES Act. Um, That was passed by the House of Representatives, I believe, last week. Um, Mm -hmm. It's still in the Senate, um, and it may or may not pass. Uh, We don't know. It's it's speculation at this point. Um, If it does pass, it could still get vetoed by the president. I don't know. Um, There's a lot of speculation at this point um, whether or not it's going to go through. So I don't know. Um, I'd say at this point, don't count on it. If it does come, use it wisely. If not, (laughs) don't worry about it. Okay. Um, Are travel employees going to be working from home or at reduced hours, uh, you know, in the office for an extended amount of time? That's a good question. So uh, right now we have a plan that the directors of the departments are going to come back to work on June 1. That's something that's set. Um, At that point, the directors are going to decide how many people are going to come back, when they're going to come back, um, what uh, roles they'll be playing in the future. Um, But they're still drafting those plans uh, and submitting those to tribal administration, who's going to be overseeing um, the entire uh, kind of restart of of the tribal operations. Okay. How long do you expect safety precautions uh, need to last? Months, years? So that that is that's the elephant in the room. Um, I was talking with friends of mine who are virologists, um, microbiologists, uh, a whole a whole slew of different scientists, um, and and to be honest, we're not sure. Um, Long term, we're thinking ideally uh, the safety precautions are in place until um, the population you know, the tribe, the state, the nation, um, develops what's called herd immunity. And herd immunity um, is when there's a natural resistance to any sort of disease, whether it's caused by a virus or a bacteria, um, in so much that uh, it can slow or stop the spread of that disease in the population. Uh, Usually that's um, acquired either through people getting sick and developing their own natural immunity to something, or through vaccination. Vaccinations are amazing. Vaccinate your kids. I'm just going to say that. Vaccinate your kids. It helps. Um, coronavirus, we, we're not sure how soon vaccinations will be um, available. Um, there are, uh, I think, 130 different uh, organizations that are universities and, and labs that are, are testing um, vaccinations and antibody um uh, components right now. Uh, I believe six of them are, are making substantial progress in that. Um, I don't remember right off the top of my head if any of them you've moved to human trials yet, but they're looking to do so soon. Um, the point is, this this might take a while. Um, and in the meantime, we encourage people to, you know, continue practicing the safety precautions of, you know, social distancing, hand washing, mask wearing, um, and limiting your time in, in large groups or, or avoiding large groups altogether. So um, I don't have a hard and fast answer on that one. And I'm sorry about that. It might take a while. <laughs> okay, so just continue as long as we as long as we have to. Yeah, stay, stay vigilant, <laughs> stay informed, um, uh, but don't drive yourself crazy with it. I mean, yeah. yeah. 
I, I, I understand that people feel fatigued. Yeah, a lot of it. A, a lot do. A lot do. And it's it's kind of funny. There was a study that actually shows that people can become chronically def- fatigued and depressed um, by reading the news or mm. watching the news on a chronic basis. Um, and so, you know, staying informed is, is good, but don't overburden yourself. Um, you know, I'm sure when things start to become safer, you'll hear about it. Um, but until then, just just be cautious um, and you know make make some good choices for yourself and your family and uh, the elderly around you. If you're a person who does test positively uh, for COVID nineteen, what sort of treatments are recommended to make you feel more comfortable physically? Okay, so if you test positive and you have an active case of COVID nineteen, eat ice cream. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. I'm not going to start there. I love ice cream and I say it always fixes everything. Um, but I was going to say, some of us are lactose intolerant. uh, I don't, I don't know that's good advice. Okay. Avoid the ice cream. Um, what you do want to do is control your body's temperature though. Um, so take Tylenol, uh, to control fevers, um, that are one of the associated symptoms that also help with pain relief. Um, make sure you're uh, drinking a high volume of fluid, um, you want to make sure your pee is as clear as possible. Um, that just gives your cells and your body uh, as much possibility and opportunity to clean your system out as possible. Um, uh, sleep uh, enough to get uh, better. For adults, that's you know between 8 to 10 hours. Um, for kids, that's between 10 and 12. Your body needs to rest. That's when it really heals up. Um, if you're awake and just can't sleep anymore, and you're feeling, you know, warm, feverish. Use cold compresses. Um, it's it's basically like treating it like a cold uh, or or a flu. The the symptoms are very similar. You treat them very similar. Um, if you have it available, use things like Pedialyte, things that provide fluids and electrolytes at the same time. Um, make sure you're eating good foods um, that are healthy: fruits, vegetables. Um, lean meats, try to stay off processed foods when you're healing up. Um, soups are always great because they provide, again, things like um, nutrients from vegetables and meats and fluids at the same time. So treat it like you would any other type of cold or fever. Okay, you mentioned Tylenol, and I know that there was some questions about whether Tylenol makes it worse. So as far as that goes... Um, Tylenol has, they think it's okay to use. Again, they're still working out the details of it. Um, some people, some people have have had overactive immune reactions when they develop COVID, and so any sort of medication has really thrown off their system. Um, but they think Tylenol is pretty safe to use in most cases. Okay. Yeah. Um. Then uh, I guess our our last question or topic is uh, Memorial Day, Memorial Day weekend. Um, So traditionally, this is a time when a lot of people get together, have cookouts, all that stuff. Um, So what, what are your biggest tips for people to stay safe over the holiday? So the number one thing is to avoid gathering in large groups. I know this is is not fun during holiday times, or during times when you know you traditionally get together, um, but there's there's one specific case, and I'll actually share a little infographic with it on the social media, um, that where uh, two individuals were uh, diagnosed positive with COVID-19, they decided that in spite of that, they'd go and they'd attend church. Um, they ended up infecting 93 people. Uh, three of them died. And from those 93 people, there are, I believe it was an additional 26 infections that were secondary infections. Um, so, you know, getting together in a large group, even if you're healthy, may not be the safest thing because um, viruses spread very quickly. Um, and you, you can't tell who may be infected because it can spread when people are asymptomatic. So we, again, encourage people not to get together in large groups. Um, additionally, if you are getting together in a small group, um, try not to share food with each other. 
Uh, a similar type of infection rate happens when people share food and drinks together. And so we'd, we'd encourage you not to share drinks. Don't drink um, from common pitchers or you know common dishes that might be brought. Uh, have your own contained uh, drink and food. Um, that said, uh, the tribe's been doing a great job at, at preventing the spread of, of COVID on the reservation. Uh, this last week, we had the National Guard uh, up on the reservation and doing COVID-19 testing. They performed um, 1,061 tests on um, members of the community. Uh, we've had 600 of the results come back so far. All of them have been negative. Um, the tribe's been doing a great job at, at keeping things out. We've only had um, two cases in the county and on the reservation the entire time, uh, and both of those people have recovered. So we'd like to you know, congratulate everyone on, on the efforts they've been doing. It's been fantastic. Um, you know, I've, I've talked, I've actually bragged about how, how the community has done to other organizations and they're thoroughly impressed with how well everyone's been reacting to the situation and how, how little it's, it's affected them. So great job, everyone. Thank you for, for being patient with the situation. Um, thank you for staying informed. Um, and over the Memorial Day weekend, please be safe, um, make good choices, stay healthy. So uh, YWANN for listening to the Menominee Indian Tribe of Wisconsin podcast. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. You can also listen to the podcast on menominee-nsn.gov under the community tab. Keep up to date by following us on Facebook at MITW Podcasts. And we are aiming to do weekly updates with Vaughn, so we welcome any community questions um, or topic suggestions that you have regarding COVID-19, and please send those to us via email at podcast.mitw.org.